Welcome to the Black Press of America, the National Newspaper Publishers Association. We're very pleased uh, to work for this White House briefing uh, today. Uh, we have a very close relationship with the Biden Harris uh, campaign. And with us today, I just want to briefly uh, introduce the chair of our board, uh, Karen Carter Richards, who is a distinguished publisher of the Forward Times newspaper in Houston, Texas, and a third generation publisher. Uh, Karen, glad you have us with us uh, today, Madam Chair. Thank you. That's Javis. And also we have with us today, Stacy Brown, the senior national correspondent, award-winning journalist for the NNPA. And Stacy is also going to help me engage uh, with our guests today. And also we're writing a, a news article about the news that we're going to break today uh, from the White House uh, task force. Uh, on COVID-19 Health Equity Task Force. And we're very pleased and very honored. Uh, one of the most outstanding uh, physicians in the country, medical leader, uh, uh, leader in her own right at Yale University, but also a vital member of the White House uh, COVID-19 Task Force on Health Equity, uh, Dr. Marcella Nunez-Smith. Dr. Nunez-Smith, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much, Dr. Chavis. It's great to be here. Really appreciate this. And uh, we're also going to be drawn before the program ends with Dr. Cameron Webb, who's also on the test. There he is right there. Dr. Webb, good to see you again. Oh, good to see you too. I had to get that <laughs> mute button unstuck. <laughs> no problem. You. So you're, you're right on time. We're just starting. We want to thank uh, you, uh, Dr. Webb and Dr. Nunez Smith, for taking this time. Uh, with the Black Press. We have 230 African-American-owned newspapers across the country and media companies. We reached uh, 25 to 30 million people a week in print and digital and social media. And we're eager uh, to learn more about the task force. But particularly, uh, the first issue we, I would like for both of you to respond to is the issue of vaccination hesit hesitation. Why is there so much hesitation in the African-American community when uh, everyone knows that this uh, vaccination is vital uh, to restoring the health of our communities. So can each of you talk about what the task force plans uh, to do, share with the black press uh, the issue of vaccination hesitation? And Dr. Dr. Nunez Smith, you can go first and then Dr. Yeah. Will. Happy, happy to go to go first here. And this is the question of the day. I mean, so let me take a, a moment up top just to say thank you, of course, for having and hosting us today in this conversation, this discussion, all of you uh, tremendous leaders and are doing so much in our communities. We deeply, deeply grateful for that. Appreciate the partnership here and this invitation for us to join. Um, so in a minute, I, you know, I will, I will give my perspective on, on kind of where that challenge is, why they're, why we're seeing um, kind of extra efforts needed to build vaccine confidence across black communities. Um, but just for us to, to level set a little bit, I know we'll, we'll dig a little deeper, um, but only in terms of kind of who is working on what in this, in this administration and how's it going. We know for sure the administration is very centered on equity. And one of the parts of that is the task force that you mentioned. And the task force is based at HHS. It's a deep honor of mine to serve as chair, working with federal members as well as non-federal members. Um, that group is advisory and is giving interim recommendations and in fact had a public facing meeting uh, just a, a month ago, a month and a half ago, where we uh, shared interim recommendations and some of them spoke to vaccine confidence. Dr. Webb and I are here um, in our roles today as part of the White House COVID-19 response team, or I'm a senior advisor, Dr. Webb is a senior policy advisor on equity. Um, and in that space, we're thinking a lot about COVID-19 resources, but also about your question. You know, how do we make sure people have the information they need um, so that they can make their own decisions about getting vaccinated? In our communities in particular, there's a lot of attention paid to historical realities. The president himself has acknowledged this, the, the disrespect, the, the mistreatment of black bodies in our country for medical experimentation and other purposes. We also know though that it's not just historic. We don't have to look to things like Tuskegee or Henrietta Lacks, that people have contemporary experiences, right? For too many folks, they can think of an experience recently themselves, their families, trying to get medical care, feeling discriminated against, getting subpar care. So we know that there are contemporary realities as well as historic realities for why some people have uh, 
that, that level of skepticism. Um, but we're always eager to provide facts and, and bring an information to the table. So folks are working with the, with the, right, the right set of information as they make the decision. But Dr. Webb, please. Well, you know, I, I think that's spot on, Dr. Smith. And I think the way that I, for both of us, we're, we're professors at medical universities, right? So I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna have to teach a little bit on this one. Vaccine hesitancy as a concept is really three different things packed into one. So on one hand, you have, you know, complacency, the folks who feel like, you know, I'm not gonna get sick from this, this virus or this virus doesn't cause that much damage. It's not a big problem in my community or in my life and I'm not that worried about it. That's vaccine complacency. Then there's vaccine confidence, which Dr. Nina Smith just spoke to, and that's kind of uh, confidence in the safety or the efficacy of the vaccine. That's confidence in the institutions who uh, are uh, offering uh, themselves as vaccine providers. And that's trust in the government that's telling you to go get vaccinated, right? And there's a huge dynamic there that we can dig into. And then the last is vaccine convenience. And that's just a matter of having real access to vaccine, not just uh, folks saying, oh, it's, it's over there. It's actually making sure that vaccine is coming to the places where it needs to go, make sure people have real and ready access to that vaccine. And so, you know, when you put those together, complacency, confidence, and convenience, those three things come together to form vaccine hesitancy. And within the Black community, we see each of those dynamics playing out. And that's why you have to start these conversations with listening ears. And instead of saying, here's why you need to go get vaccinated, you say, hey, let me hear a little bit more about why you're not quite yet at yes, why you're still thinking about this, why you're still in the wait and see mode. And then we can figure out if I can answer any questions for you. That's the posture we have to take. That's how we're going to get you know, through to more and more folks. And a lot of folks have gotten to yes. We've seen these polls since December really trend uh, in the Black community away from folks being wait and see and toward folks being like, yes, I'm ready to get vaccinated. And we just need to keep seeing that trend continue. Very good. Stacey. Yeah, uh, thanks, Dr. Chavis, and thanks, uh, Dr. Webb and, and Dr. Nunez Smith and the White House. We thank the White House as well for for bringing this all together. We know that the Biden-Harris administration has worked feverishly to get people vaccinated. Do we have an idea of how many people of color, as opposed to others, whites uh, and, 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 and others, have been vaccinated to this point? Yeah, I'll, yeah. I'll just, oh, go, go ahead, Dr. Webb. Yeah, you get us started on this one. I, I can start off with this one, and I'll say that we do have an idea. We know that, you know, certainly um, when you look at it in terms of percentages of, you know, the folks where we know their race or ethnicity, we know that right now it's a little less than 9% of those who've received vaccines where we know their race or ethnicity are Black. We know that some around 12 to 13% are Hispanic. And so, you know, that representation, those numbers have continued to improve since earlier on in the pandemic, certainly since January. So we're making a lot of progress. But I have to point out, there's still a lot of missing data, right? There's still about 40% of the shots that went into arms where we don't know the race and ethnicity because it hasn't always been a required data field. And so that's something we've been work, working really closely with states on is saying, hey, we really want to see who's getting vaccinated. That's going to give us a little bit more clarity there. But we have some other things that can suggest to us who's getting vaccinated. We can look by zip code. We can look uh, in, in communities that are really concentrated communities of color. We can see what are the vaccination rates there. So we have some other ways of essentially triangulating who's getting vaccinated. And the short answer is we know we still have work to do. We still have ground to make up to get more vaccinated. But, uh, but in terms of precise numbers, again, we have some missing data that make it hard to give you an exact number, but we know that we have some room still to go. Yeah, thanks, Dr. Webb. Dr. Chavis? Yes, um, President Biden uh, just yesterday announced that by July the 4th, the goal is to get 70% of the American uh, adult population uh, to be vaccinated. That's a, that's a big number uh, by July the 4th. Uh, I would like for both of you, uh, Dr. Nunez Smith and Dr. Webb, to address, um, particularly, you're speaking now to the Black press of America. Uh, how can we assist the Biden Harris administration in reaching this goal, particularly to the constituencies that we serve? Uh, we are the trusted voice of Black America as the Black press. And we want to be working more closely with the CDC and with the White House in your messaging. But uh, this goal of 70 percent by July the 4th, can you both speak to this goal? Absolutely. Yeah, thanks, Dr. Chavis. I mean, it's a very ambitious goal. Right? But we know that ultimately we're trying to get everyone in the country vaccinated 
who medically is able to. And so that is ultimately where we're headed. And we know that we have to do this as quickly as possible for all the reasons folks have heard about, you know, variants, other things, but also just getting people connected back with their lives. Um, and Dr. Webb just told you where we are in terms of the state of the data. That's really important. Um, this is a, a big goal for us to fill the data gap. I think it's a moment also for us to, to recognize and realize how hyper-local all of this is. And so even if you look at the data by, by state, by zip code, there's a difference in terms of the proportion of people who are vaccinated by race, ethnicity across these different jurisdictions. And so what I always try to stress to folks is yes, as a country, we have this goal, but this has to be a community level goal too. I mean, here where I where I live in Connecticut, we see vast difference in New Haven where, uh, where Yale is located, majority, a community of color, we're at about 24% rate for vaccination. And some of our other neighbors are, are at 78% in some of the other zip codes. And so they've already met that target and going past that. And it really is about getting everyone who is in our, our social network, our community vaccinated. So just important for us to hold on to this idea as a really hyper-local community level phenomenon on goal. Um, very generous to talk about the partnership here and how we might work better together. You know, one of the things Dr. Webb and I were just talking about recently is how key it is for folks to see people they know getting vaccinated, right? That's really important. So lifting up those stories in black press of just folks who are getting vaccinated and given their story, kind of what was their vaccination journey? What motivated them to get vaccinated? You know, having them talk openly and honestly about their experience. Um, and, you know, this is you're know, such a powerful vehicle for combating the misinformation, the disinformation that's everywhere in social media. It really is one of our greatest challenges right now is getting ahead of this narrative where there's just Yes, Dr. Webb, thank you. Yeah, you know, I think I think that hit the nail on the head. The main things that I would add there, are really just accentuating that point about mis and disinformation, and and we see it all the time. And and I think we see a lot of folks. I can go to the barber shop. I can go, you know, around my community, and the things that I hear are folks asking questions that are rooted in disinformation. Really starting off with intentionally misleading people about what's real and what's true about the virus, about the vaccine, and even about the variants. But it becomes misinformation I guess, as it gets spread from person to person, from family member to family member, from friend to friend. And so it's so important as a trusted voice uh, you know, for the black press to, to not lean into you know, telling the story that somebody wants you to tell. Tell the story that's really happening on the ground. Tell the story of, of grandmothers who are able to spend time with their grandchildren again. Tell the story of, of people who are getting uh, taking those steps back to normalcy because those are the stories that people need to hear. That's the stories that are those are the stories that are going to motivate folks, particularly younger folks who want to get back to normal sooner, uh, back to normal life. These vaccines are a key path to that. And I think understanding what's true and what's real about the data on the safety and the efficacy. I think there's a, you know, at this point, almost the, the you know, misinformation is that anybody who says that they're safe, they must be trying to hide something. Well, that's just not true. You know, the science bears out that these vaccines are safe. And so it's important for us to make sure we're sharing that message. There's a reason why so many healthcare providers have gotten vaccinated because we know the real risk is COVID-19, the virus. It's not the vaccine that prevents people from dying or being hospitalized. And so getting the right message out there um, as such a trusted voice, I think that's going to be a key. And that works, I mean, more important now than ever. Very good. Um, uh, Karen Carter Richards, the chair of the NMPA, I know you talk to publishers all over the country. What? Just share your perspective, uh, Madam Chair, of how you think uh, what Dr. Noonan Smith is uh, reporting today and with Dr. Webb, their reports uh, will resonate uh, with our readers and our viewers across the country. I was really glad to hear the answers from the doctors because I'm, I have a lot of uh, young people around me and, and the biggest thing I hear from them is uh, we don't know enough. And I usually come back with the answer, well, you do know hundreds of thousands of people are dead, how much more you need to know. So the answer that Dr. Uh, Webb just gave really helps me to, us to write stories, to, to kind of figure out how, how do we reach the young people who are not, they're making it easier and easier. I went to my pharmacist the other day and he said, have your kids been, uh, had the vaccine? And I said, well, my son has, but my daughters haven't. And 
and just getting them getting them there. So I think this has helped me to give put another give it another perspective of how we are writing our stories. Great, uh, Stacy. Yeah, and uh, Dr. Webb and and Dr. Uh, Nunez Smith for for both of you, um, can you talk a little bit about the vaccine itself? You you have really um, extrapolated why people might um, be a little hesitant. You, you've explained that uh, and you explained it very well. But the vaccine, there's still misinformation, as you stated, about what's in the vaccine. Is the vaccine going to make me sick? Is it going to you know kill me? Uh, can you really put some minds at ease by tell, telling uh, folks, our viewers, our listeners, our readers, America, right. Uh, the safety of these vaccines. Absolutely. Well, I can I can kick it off. You know, I think that we the first thing that I always tell folks is that we have three vaccines that are safe and three vaccines that are effective. And, and just to put a finer point on that, uh, I come from a big family. I'm one of six kids. Uh, my there's my wife and there's my two parents. And between those individuals, those adults in my immediate families, if you will. We've had uh, individuals who've had the Pfizer vaccine, who've had the Moderna vaccine, and who've had Johnson & Johnson. And what I say without any reservation is that every single one of my family members who I love so much, every fiber of my scientific knowledge knows that they each got a life-saving vaccine. They each got a very safe vaccine. They each got a very effective vaccine. And so that's good news. That's the starting point. Now you've got your messenger RNA vaccines, that's Pfizer and Moderna, and then you have a viral vector vaccine, that's what the Johnson & Johnson vaccines, that's the single shot vaccine. So they work a little bit differently, but the point is the same, they're teaching your body how to recognize the threat that is COVID-19 without ever introducing the full virus into the body. So that's part of the, the misinformation. Some people think that it's actually giving you the virus. It's not. It's actually just teaching your body how to recognize one piece of that virus, the, the spike protein, so your body is good at recognizing, hey, here comes the bad guy, because the bad guy always has that spike protein. So it's not introducing that whole virus. I think these are some of the, the myths that we have to break down so people understand. You know, we have great data and we talk about the safety before they ever made it uh, in, you know, to, to market, if you will, through to get the emergency use authorization. Over 75,000 people um, had gone through those trials, 10% of whom were black and over 20% in one of the trials who were Latino. And I think that that's important to keep in mind too, because there was representation in the trials. And now you know, we have 105 million people who've been fully vaccinated. So I think it's important to know the data that we have on those 105 million people continues to tell us these vaccines are safe and they're effective. And we should we should take a second and talk about Johnson & Johnson as well. You know, I don't want to cram all that in one answer, but I think just speaking to kind of where the safety really lies. But I'll pass to Dr. Nunez Smith if she wants to add anything about how the vaccines work. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Webb. I mean, it's such a critical question for people to know this information and also to know about the processes. Dr. Webb started to speak to that, but I've heard from so many folks who think it was also politicized and they don't have confidence in that review process Dr. Webb spoke to. And, you know, I think that's a fair question. I'm here to say those processes are transparent um, and they are, in fact, I think we should have high confidence in them. You know, in addition to thinking about who is in the clinical trials, so important, and there is diverse representation representation there. Also recognizing there's diverse representation in the scientists who are part of the development and leading on the development of these vaccines. I mean, lifting up those stories of the diverse scientists who are part of that review process as well. Um, all of that, I think, is really important for people to know as they are gathering information in this space. And speaking to these systems, you know, we also have very rigorous systems around the surveillance, the follow-up, the vigilance. And so when we talk about J&J, &J, which is such an important conversation, one of the takeaways from that, I think, is that it has, it has for, for me, certainly strengthened my confidence in how the systems work, that the system was sensitive enough to find what were, at the time, six cases of a very rare, rare blood clot um, in almost you know, 8 million doses given. And that gave great reassurance. Also, 
that the FDA and CDC, out of an abundance of caution, said, we're going to pause. We want to make sure that we have a time to review these data, that we have all the information we need. Are there additional cases? We want to solicit that information. And in the end, there were 15. But also, we want to be able to talk to doctors about how to treat this blood clot that behaves a little differently than other blood clots and let people know some of the information that they need around what symptoms might be there to present. So the systems, a part of this conversation with you know the safety, the, the efficacy, the effectiveness, and sort of the trust in the systems around this, I think important for people to have that full understanding of exactly how many people and how much work goes into this and that no steps, none at all, were skipped in any of this, the development of the vaccine right through to the authorization. Yeah, you know, very good. Very good. Go ahead, ahead, Sis. Yeah, Dr. Tibbs, we uh, was fortunate, you and I, uh, to interview Dr. James Hildreth of Meharry Medical uh, College, who, excuse me, (coughs) oh, I'm so sorry, who sat on the board of the FDA to approve the vaccines. And I remember him, and Dr. Chavis may remember as well, he was steadfast. We are not going to approve something that can hurt Americans, particularly Black Americans. He was very steadfast with that. And having said that, um, Dr. Webb, Dr. Uh, Nunez Smith, one of the things that keeps coming up when I'm, I have both my shots, Dr. Chavis has had both his, I believe our chairs have both of hers, um, the, the sore arms. People want to know aspirin, Tylenol, and, and what about caffeine, alcohol? When should you partake in any of that? Yeah. And so, you know, in terms of my clinical practice, I work on the coronavirus unit at the University of Virginia. That's my, my medical practice. And so I get a lot of these questions from all directions. And and what we tell folks, for the most part, you know, if you, if you feel like you need something to help with the pain uh, or to help with, you know, feeling a little bit better, if you have some soreness, some, some achy joints, uh, take some Tylenol. You know, that's not going to cause a big problem. Uh, I think people are, are, you don't want people to be too, uh, too hyper aware of, you know, the impact that something like, uh, something like Advil will have, right? The reality is that these vaccines are designed to have a good response. So don't, don't worry too much about that. But I think that you, you just pointed out something that's really important. What are those common side effects that people have. And so for people who are worried, we we found in the most recent uh, data is that there are people who are like, look, I'm I'm comfortable with how safe and how effective the vaccine is. It's just, I can't miss a day of work uh, because of these side effects. And I know a lot of folks who who were feeling kind of crummy after that second dose. Well, here's here's the thing, folks, um, it's gonna be some discomfort at that site injection, that's one thing that a lot of people will have, some feeling tired throughout the day, some muscle aches, some joint aches, some headache. Those are the most common kinds of symptoms that people have. Those are the common kinds of symptoms people have after vaccines in general. Now, more rarely, if folks have a history of severe allergic reactions, that's one that we keep a close eye on. And we say you want to be really closely observed. If you have a history of severe allergic reactions to vaccines, then you want to be observed a little bit more closely when you get vaccinated. We have you stick around for about 30 minutes. But those are the main side effects that we tend to see. And I think that the important thing is they tend to go away within 24 to 36 hours, but we don't want that to be a barrier to folks getting vaccinated. So that's why just, uh, you know, the, a week, about a week and a half ago now, uh, the president announced kind of paid time off at small and, you know, getting funds to small and medium sized businesses. So they're reimbursed to make sure that their employees can take time off, not just to get vaccinated, but also if they're not feeling so well, you know, that next day, and that's going to be helpful. We're navigating all those other challenges for getting vaccinated. So just, I wanted to, to give those nuggets there. That's something that can be helpful to some people as well. Uh, and, if I, and if I might, to, to because absolutely, Dr. Webb, 100 percent. And to say, you know, that that second dose is really important. If you are if you are taking any of the vaccines that are the two doses, it's really important to get that second one. And we know that sometimes these stories, you know, some folks pause a little bit on that. It's really important. We talk about durability. That means how long it's going to last, that protection. So just critically important. We know we have different variants and out there. We want to get the best response for our immune system that we can. So want to make sure we, we complete that second dose. But, you know, one of the reasons I really opened my mic was to say so grateful for Dr. Hildreth and really appreciate you lifting that up and his important work and that review committee. He's also a member of the, the HHS COVID-19 Health Equity Task Force. We're so grateful to have his voice and expertise in that space as well. 
Yeah. Greg. Dr. Davis, um, so you'll know our publishers that are watching. We got many publishers watching. Um, Calvin Anderson of the New Chai State Defender has a question. He says, after completing the vaccine regimen, how important is continuous testing and tracing? Well, for individuals who've been fully vaccinated, that's, that's a great question, right? So fully vaccinated means a couple of things. You know, if you've gotten one of the two shot regimens, it means you've had, you know, both shots and you've made it 14 days after that second shot. So for Pfizer, you get the second dose three weeks after the first dose. For Moderna, it's four weeks after the first dose. And so in total, you know, from first dose to fully immunized, that's five weeks for the Pfizer vaccine. It's six weeks for Moderna. For Johnson & Johnson, actually, it's just two weeks. You get that one shot, two weeks later, you have that full immunity. Now, that's a really important moment because that's where that CDC guidance comes in. And that CDC guidance is, is about masking. It's about who you can interact with. It's about being in, in outdoor spaces. It's about getting a step closer to normal. And so that's really important. They're going to continue to update that guidance. And, and, that, and I want to be clear, that guidance is somewhat cautious because we still have more cases circulating in the country than we want. And so even though those numbers are coming down, even though we're seeing 35, 40,000 cases a day and not 100 and 125,000 cases a day, it's still more circulation than we want to see. So that's why masks are so important. We still see variants. So that's why masks are still important. In terms of testing and tracing, one thing to keep in mind is that for most folks who've been fully vaccinated, they're much less likely to get COVID-19. That's what we've learned from the number of vaccines that have gone into arms and the impact that they've had. It's really, we don't see people dying from COVID. We don't see folks needing to be hospitalized by and large, and cases are extremely rare. But the thing is, and I always make this point, the Pfizer vaccine, for example, is a very effective vaccine, 95% effective. I told you a little while ago, 100 million Americans were fully vaccinated as of last Friday. That's right. 100 million Americans, 95% effective. That means 5 million individuals it wasn't as effective in. And so that's why it's still important to wear masks. You won't know if you're one of those individuals or not. And so, yes, it works really well. But for one out of 20 people, it's not necessarily going to work as well. And so we're dependent on the people around you getting vaccinated, cases continuing to come down, and you still using those best public health practices for as long as cases are still, you know, we have cases in our community the way that we do. And if you do feel sick, if you do feel like you've got symptoms that are consistent with COVID, go get tested. That's still important. Just because you've had shots doesn't mean that there's no chance that it's COVID. It's still important to go get tested if you have those symptoms. You lose your sense of smell. You lose your sense of taste. Um, you're just feeling really sick, right? Those are reasons to go get tested. It may come back negative, and if it comes back positive, that you know that has been known to happen sometimes. But the vaccines still do work, and that's important to keep in mind. Yes. Um, I know that Dr. Noonan Smith has to leave in a, about a couple of minutes. And Dr. Webb, you're going to stay with us to the, uh, to the top of the uh, hour. But before Dr. Uh, Nunez Smith leaves, I just wanted to ask, can if you, you have a platform right now, Dr. Nunez Smith, what is your message to Black America, given all of what you know about COVID-19, the progress and the challenges, uh, what is the single most important message that you would like to give to Black America today? Thank you so much, Dr. Chavez. You know, what I said at Black America is, you know, let us not has this opportunity to benefit from scientific discovery, right? When we talk about therapies, when we talk about vaccines, we see that our communities are lagging. The administration is committed 100% to making sure that access is in the issue. You know, we started that at the beginning. We have to make sure that the therapies that are out there that we know work when people do have COVID-19, that those are in every community and available to everyone. Um, we have to make sure that people know the same is true for vaccines. And then we have to make sure people get the information that they need. And so the, the ask is, please, please, you know, go to the folks that you trust. We're here today in this community of trusted voices. But as you gather information, be it about therapies, about the testing, about vaccines, please seek those voices that you know have your best interests at heart. So much of what you'll find on social media and online is, is not um, intended to have your best interests at heart. So we wanna make sure that information is out there, that people feel very confident um, in who they're talking to and in the decisions that they're making. But at the end of the day, you know, we're very fortunate to have 
these options. We have vaccines, we have therapies that work um, in our country, and we need to take advantage and be there uh, at this moment of scientific discovery and benefit from that. And that's how we're gonna that's how we're gonna get back to our our new normal, reclaim our joy in our communities and our families, keeping each other safe. Well, thank you. We wish you all the best, best, Dr. Marcellus, uh, Nunez Smith, and uh, uh, all the work you're doing at Yale and with the White House Task Force. Thank you so much for being with us and we wish you well and we'll stay in touch. Absolutely. Thank you, everybody. Be well. Thank you. So, uh, Dr. Webb, um, down at the University of Virginia in Charlottesville, we know some of your colleagues uh, have been on with us there. You're doing a great work there. Uh, a similar question. We've done some work with the CDC. We've had Dr. Walensky on, uh, the new director of the CDC, and uh, we are reaching out also to uh, the Health and Human Services. Uh, how specifically can the Black press work with the task force uh, beyond having an interview like this? Uh, I know that uh, both uh, HSS and the CDC, they're doing a lot of advertising. I'm getting uh, quotes from some of our publishers' questions. Is there anything that we can do to strengthen how we can utilize our platforms in the Black press to get the messaging out? Uh, through uh, the ad dollars, through the uh, marketing dollars, through the campaigns that the CDC and HSS are launching to reach the 70 uh, percent goal that uh, President Biden has established between now and July the 4th. Well, you've got no quarrel with me on pursuing that wholeheartedly. I think that's that's important stuff. You talk about the reach, the audience, and the trust. Those are all the ingredients for a successful campaign and successful work. And so, you know, I think you're talking to the right folks. You know, for me, I'm based at, at the White House, so I don't, for one, I'm not allowed to deal with contracts specifically, but for sure. two, I don't work specifically at HHS. But I think that, um, you know, that the key is making sure that you're in touch with that we can do this campaign that's based out of HHS. You know, of course, there's, you know, a whole, a whole process in terms of how they're they're picking folks, but one thing that the vice president has been very adamant about, uh, you got representative or former representative uh, Cedric Richmond, who's uh, public engagement in the White House, very adamant about Ambassador Susan Rice, very adamant that we make sure that we are leaning into diverse media as a part of this strategy. And I think that in an unprecedented way, that's been a focal point in how we're, we're reaching out, how we're trying to engage. And so, you know, if you see opportunities and the ability to to reach an audience in a new and different way, you know, make sure that you get, you know, you get that word out there. There are definitely uh, open ears for that. We are, you know, certainly looking for those partners who can continue to deliver trusted messages to the communities that need them. So, and if there's any way I can be helpful in that, you know where to find me. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm happy yes. to but in a good word, because I think that that's, that's exactly what the, the black press is here to do. That's exactly what this reach is for. We built this up over generations and it's over generations to tell our stories to our people in our way. And this is one of those moments where we need uh, our storytellers telling our stories. This is one of those moments where, you know, truly we've got us and that's what, what it has to be in some instances to reach a lot of folks. And so any way that I can be helpful, don't hesitate to reach out. But I think that, um, I think that you, you've got the right message. Absolutely. And give a shout out to Dr. Ebony Hilton and to the other doctors there at the University of uh, Virginia. All of you are doing such great work. Thank you. Thank you. And, and Dr. I want to, James, I know our chair, I, I'm sorry, uh, Dr. Webb, I know our chair has a question and also Jackie Hampton of the uh, Mississippi Link has a question, but let's go to our chair first. Sorry, I have to unmute it. Um, recently, it's been in the news that a lot of, uh, I don't remember the number, thousands of people did not get their second dose. How does that affect people who did not go back to get the second dose? Where are they? Do they start over? How does, what happens now? Yeah, so that, that news story, I think, um, and this is a great example of us telling stories the right way, right? Because what will happen is folks will grab that they'll amplify it and they'll say, look at this, people aren't getting their second doses. No, no, 92% of people are getting their second doses. Right. I've, I've been in this for a long time and I can tell you, there are a couple of different vaccines out there that have been around decades that people do not go back and get their second or third dose of different vaccines. That's a, that's a lot to ask somebody to show up a couple of weeks later to do the same thing in a busy life, especially in a time like this. And so the fact that 92% of people are going back First of all, that's a big deal. Right. Second of all, that 8% number, it's probably an overestimate because there are a lot of people who are getting their first shot in one space 
and then getting their second shot somewhere else. So they may have got their first shot at, you know, a CVS and then getting their second shot at the mass vaccination site or so on and so forth. And that's not necessarily capturing that they got that second shot. And so, you know, and, and the final thing is for some people, you know, we know the data tells us you can get that second shot up to 42 days later. Now, we want you to get it right on time, but you can get it up to 42 days later. So don't don't I, I think it's important for us not to start a story that, hey, people aren't getting their second shot because that's going to start people thinking, well, maybe I don't want to get my second shot. That's right. just not true. People are getting their second shot because people are smart and they know that you get that first shot, it gets you started. Yes, the number that was thrown around, but it doesn't last quite as long. And if you're going to go through the trouble of getting a vaccine, you want to get the full deal. You want to get as protected as you can get. That's both shots. 14 days later, you are fully protected. And that's going to protect you from variants. That's going to give you the, what we call it, neutralizing antibodies, that as soon as that COVID comes into your body, that second shot gives you neutralizing antibodies to stop COVID in its tracks before it can cause any problems. That's an important deal. And as Dr. Nunez Smith was saying, so... You know, I'm I'm seeing this on the ground in my clinical practice. I'm seeing this, you know, from my perspective, you know, working in the White House. The truth is, people are getting both of their shots, and and I don't I don't want people to uh, to get confused and think that that's not the case. Great. Thank you for clearing Great. that up. Great. Absolutely, I think that's extremely important that you did clear that up, Dr. Webb and uh, Jackie Hampton, our publisher down at the Mississippi Link in Jackson. Uh, she says, what is the likelihood, Dr. Webb, that we will need booster shots uh, before the year ends? Yeah, it, that's a it's a great question. It's one that I've gotten a lot uh, recently. And part of why is because there have been some news stories about the need for booster shots. And, and Dr. Fauci, who I think a lot of people look to, uh, he was like, hey, it's possible. We might. And that's true. We might. And some of the factors that go into that are how many folks are getting vaccinated now, how effective we are at stopping the virus from spreading. Here's the thing. The way this virus works is when it gets into your body, its number one goal is to make its way into a cell and start making more of itself. And while it's making more of itself, sometimes the virus makes mistakes. It copies you know, one of the proteins wrong and that creates a different version of the virus. We call those variants. Some of those variants are better at infecting people. Some of those variants are better at making people really sick. Right now, the vaccines that we have, they're really effective against the variants that we have. But the more cases that we have, the more viral replication within our bodies, within our cells that we see, the more likely it is that we're going to have variants that cause more problems for our treatments and our vaccines. And that is going to be the number one reason why we may need a booster in the future is if we have variants that our current vaccines don't work as well against. And we don't know for a fact that that's going to be the case. It also somewhat depends on how much of the population gets vaccinated in this pass. You know, if it, you know the president's goal by July 4th is 70 percent. But that doesn't mean that that's herd immunity, right? That's another, that's another term that people throw around a lot. Herd immunity is when enough people have been vaccinated that the virus has nowhere to go. And that's been modeled lots of different times. And some folks say somewhere between 75, 85%. The fact of the matter is we don't exactly know what that number is, but we do know we'll know it when we see it, right? It's not gonna be like flipping a light switch. It's gonna be that you don't see cases anymore and enough people are vaccinated that the virus isn't going anywhere. And I think that that's gonna be one of the real keys too. If we achieve that, there's less of a need for a booster shot. So again, a lot of it has to do with what we do, the decisions we make today, uh, you know, how effectively we maintain public health practices. Uh, I, you know, it's getting warm outside. Folks want to get out and do things. How effectively we kind of make sure we're still being careful and cautious while we're doing it, because this isn't over yet. And and you got to see it through. You got to run through the tape on this one. Make sure that we finish the job and stamp out this virus once and for all. Excellent. And Dr. Webb, what's the feeling about and this question comes from our, the NNPA's executive administrator, Claudette Perry. What's the feeling about the Pfizer announcements that they recommend vaccinating children as young as six months? Well, so I think what Pfizer is doing is they're going to be working their way back. Right now, they have data on uh, young people between the ages of 12 and 15. Next, they're going to do between 9 and 12, then between 6 and 9, then between 3 and 6, then 6 months to age 3, right? They're going to work their way back. Now, the thing is, uh, you know, we found that for pregnant women who are vaccinated, they actually pass on some of those protective antibodies to the newborn. So that's really important. That can protect newborns for some period of time. 
But what, if what we find is that these vaccines are also safe and also effective in, in uh, you know, newborns and infants and young children, um, then we want to make sure that's available for them as well. We've seen already one child dying from COVID-19 is one too many, right? And I think that's just a verifiable fact. Nobody wants to have that story as a part of their family. And so I think especially the disproportionate impact this pandemic has had in communities of color, it's going to be children from our communities who are at the greatest risk. So the first thing is let's make sure it's safe. That's what Pfizer is doing. It's doing those those uh, trials to make sure that it's safe and it's effective in kids. And if they find out that it is, they're going to send that to the Food and Drug Administration to get a, an authorization. And once they get that authorization, it's going to go before the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices. A lot of folks sitting down, looking at all those data and deciding if that makes sense. So there's a lot of steps in between. Pfizer just saying, hey, we want to vaccinate six month olds. A lot of work to do. But I don't I wouldn't say I'm against it altogether. If it saves lives like these vaccines, shown, they're able to do lives. Very good. Well, well Dr. Cameron Webb, uh, you know, the information that you share with us has been excellent. Uh, it's been informative, it's been substantive, it's been factual. And as you know, there's a lot of, as you mentioned earlier, a lot of disinformation out there, particularly on social media. You, know, you remember last year this time, they were even telling people on social media that if you have metal in, if you, in your skin, if you are of African descent, you can't get the virus. A big falsehood. Uh, how do we uh, work to make sure that people get the actual true facts going forward? Uh, so that more and more African Americans can protect themselves against uh, this deadly virus. Well, I'll give you an example from my own family. My my mom, who's a school teacher, uh, because she was going back in the school, she got really interested in this virus and how it works in the vaccines and the impact that they can have. She got to know well. Well, my mom now lives in Virginia, but she's one of ten kids from Alexandria, Louisiana. She called her siblings and she said, "Hey, have y'all been vaccinated yet?" She talked to her siblings all in their 50s and 60s and some in their 70s about getting vaccinated. And so one by one, they made the decision to do so. But it was just the other day, actually. My uncle Greg, call him Uncle Groove, he was the one who was the holdout. And he was like, I don't know if I'm ready to get vaccinated. And what happened was he went to a he went to get his car washed. And True Vine Baptist Church right down the street was holding a vaccination event. And he thought about what my mom had said to him. He thought about all the information he had been hearing from his siblings. And he said, you know what, I'm ready. He walked right across the street. He got his shot of Johnson & Johnson in his arm. In, in one week's time from, from this weekend, he's gonna be fully vaccinated against COVID. That's how it happens. It happens in regular everyday conversations. It doesn't require somebody from Washington telling you what to do, or even your doctor telling you what to do. We've got us, our, our ability is paramount. We have the opportunity to do that. We just have to keep seeking good information and be bold enough to speak to the people around us and say, here's why I got to yes. And I hope you take the time to do your own research and make your own good decisions. Awesome. Very good. Well, listen, um, Dr. Cameron Webb, thank you for your leadership on the White House Task Force. Thank you for your leadership at the University of Virginia. And overall, uh, you know, I'm, we're so proud of our African-American physicians, our African-American doctors like you, and you're a great example, great role model. Uh, uh, as the last thing before we end, could you encourage um, uh, young people today, uh, Generation Z, as well as millennials, uh, to consider the medical field? One of the things that we, we know that in a lot of our communities, there's still a shortage of black doctors, black nurses, uh, black healthcare professionals. So can you talk about the opportunities as we close out this session and on behalf of the Black Press, on behalf of the National Newspaper Publishers Association, uh, we really thank you and thank the White House for making this opportunity for the Black Press uh, current today. Well, you know, I thank you for the opportunity and and I think about, you know, I'm, I'm almost 38 years old and in my lifetime, I've worked for three presidents on healthcare issues. And, and that particular opportunity that I've had started with being a doctor, started with having a passion for taking care of people in my community. And I think that's a really unique role. So for young people who are out there who want to make a difference in their community, this is a really special field. And it's hard work, uh, but at the same time, it's some of the most rewarding work that you will do. And what I can tell you is that if you're in this space, whether it's as a doctor or a nurse, a physician assistant, or somebody else, a 
public health professional in this healthcare space, understand the impact you have on shaping lives, on shaping futures for our community. There's nothing like it. And so, you know, I definitely encourage you to look into it. Definitely encourage you to, to you know, climb that mountain. It's worth it. And uh, we haven't seen the numbers. Uh, you know, if you look at black men in medicine, that number has been flat over the last 40 years. We're not seeing increases. So we need people to make those decisions uh, to, to get involved, to get into these professions and to be voices and advocates uh, for our community as things move forward. But yeah, thank you much for inviting me on and I'm always happy to be here with you and look forward to working with you all moving forward to, to end this pandemic and, and take care of our communities. Thanks so much. We appreciate Very good. it. Thank you so much. All right. God bless. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.